Welcome back, my friends, to another edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Doing the radio show every day, <laughs> the nightly news uh, weeknights at 7 o'clock Central. Man, it's incredible. It's just one day blends into the next, especially as our world accelerates into the New World Order system. Coming up, uh, film producer Bill Bean is going to be joining us. He videotaped McVeigh about a year after he was supposedly out of the U.S. Army. We'll document why that's so important. And then the one, the only, Stuart Rhodes, the founder of Oath Keepers. He'll break down the National Defense Authorization Act and the admission that America is now a lawless police state. That is all coming up this evening. But first, let's get into our top story, Iran. Remember, this is teleprompter free news here, ladies and gentlemen. Assassination of Iranian nuclear scientists is a familiar story. It's the Israelis' uh, favorite way of having a motorcycle assassin drive up beside you in traffic and place a magnet bomb that's then remote controlled, detonated after the motorcycle speeds away. And they've killed, uh, what now, uh, five of their scientists, uh, or bombed five scientists, four have died in just the last few years. Missile bases are being blown up as well. Uh, all across Iran, generals are being assassinated. It is war. The war against Iran's uh, nuclear program, whether you can debate whether it's weaponized or they're looking for electricity, it is certainly on. Can you imagine if... If the Iranians were doing stuff like this in England or Israel or the U.S., I mean, it'd be World War III. But it's like, well, they're Iranians. You know, it's good to assassinate their people and blow up their bases and blow up police stations. I mean, that's what the good guys do. You know, because when the good guys blow up your police station, it's not terrorism. It's, it's loving. When Obama attacks Libya to put al-Qaeda in charge, they're called love bombs. It's, it's kinetic action. Meanwhile, uh, Panetta has come out in the news and said that Iran is not developing nukes. Well, whether they've developed them or not, I mean, Pakistan's got 100, Israel's got 300, 400, 500, nobody knows, we know it's more than 300. I mean, this is all a giant joke. And Iran is now having embargoes being set up by the UN and, and NATO and, and the EU to shut off their refined gasoline being brought in. They sell raw oil and import gas about 51% back in. This will shut Iran down, that's an act of war. So Iran can't have gasoline, but you can't have reactors either for power. <laughs> and we have the clip of Panetta talking about it. Here it is. Uh, are they uh, trying to develop a nuclear weapon? Uh, no, but we know that they're trying to develop a nuclear capability. And that's what concerns us. And our red line to Iran is do not develop a nuclear weapon. That's a red line for us. Yeah. Could we if we... That's the red line. Let's continue here. Mafia is now Italy's biggest bank, and they're squeezing the life out of small business, quite literally. Daily Mail reports, the mafias always run Italy. But we've been taught that only Italians have organized crime. I mean, the head of the FBI in the 50s said there was no such thing as organized crime. No, organized crime is real. It's running our society here today. And so we've got that report there. Organized crime is the biggest earner in Italy, with a turnover of more than... 100 billion euros a year, according to a report by business chiefs. So rule by organized crime gangs. We've got them here, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citibank, Wells Fargo. They're the big six Federal Reserve owners. We taught the Bank of England into that. That's six. But there's another report. Bilderberg elitist Charlie Rose invokes Ron Paul electability myth. There is this mantra that he can't win even as he's in second place all across the country, and they try to sell us uh, Mitt Romney, who loves open borders, gun control, abortion, carbon taxes, and wrote Obamacare. Uh, it is truly staggering. Here is uh, Charlie Rose feeding you his line of uh, claptrap, telling you that you got to think the way he says you should think. He's your God, and you're going to do what he says. Some out of the Romney camp say that you're not electable, and they're happy you're in second place. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I've been electable. I've won 12 elections already, and we're doing quite well now. Uh, it's amazing that I do so much better than those other candidates that are all electable. They're all in fourth, fifth, and sixth place, but they're all electable. But I come in second or third, and all of a sudden people say, oh, he's not electable. I don't know how that adds up. Well, there you have it. Uh, let's go ahead and continue looking at election 2012 here. Uh, good news for Ron Paul, Florida may allow proportional delegates. He's already gotten 
second place uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, they cheated him and got a close third uh, with second uh, in uh, Iowa. But Florida is a winner-take-all state. In other words, whoever wins the primary gets all the delegates. The proposed change means delegates would be divided up amongst top finishers, which is part of our electoral uh, college system. It's kind of a parliamentary system built into the general election. Uh, continuing, Ron Paul says to all the other parties who are getting two points, five points, six points, drop out the other five candidates. Let me go head up against Mitt Romney, who's about as conservative or libertarian uh, as Mao Zedong, and he's urging all of his opponents to drop out, and we are as well, and you should urge them to do what Michelle Bachman and others have done. Now, um, let's go ahead and go to our next story here. That's Rick Santorum has basically come out and said, eradicate Muslims, uh, all, I guess, billion, 200 million that's inherently evil folks, and uh, uh, we've got to uh, basically uh, have a war with these people. Uh, just amazing. You know, why is our own government actually funding the radical Muslims in every case and then using them as a pretext to take our liberties while leaving the borders wide open? I mean, none of this makes any sense. The truth is, Muslims are just like everybody else. They want to live in a free society. They're anti-communist on average, and they just want a good life for their children. And by the way, we heard a video last night that showed a bunch of children getting medical treatment from Iraq by citizens in the U.S. through different charities, bringing them here to give them new faces, you know, give them surgery for shrapnel on their spine. And I saw neocons attacking them, saying, oh, they're Arabs, they deserve to die on my YouTube channel. Those are really sick people. But see, they've got to call them savages and, and not human, or they'll have to feel what they've done. And that's why they're doing that. And it's, 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 an, it's incredibly disgusting. And uh, I'm not going to sit here and have this done in my name. So myself and 70-plus percent of other Americans are against all these wars, and we're tired of it. And Ron Paul's tired of it. So we're done. And uh, people like Santorum, uh, you're what's helping destroy Western civilization. You are a disgusting globalist joke. We played last night criticizing the Tea Party three years ago, but now saying he endorses it. I wanna, oh, but you're good friends with Sandusky and support him. Mm -hmm. And you help, well, we did some stories on that. You're a very nice person, aren't you? You're somebody the establishment can trust. Uh, let's go ahead and get into this next report here. Uh, moving right along from... Uh, Oh, to another little Ken doll. Mitt Romney on the National Defense Authorization Act, one of the biggest stories in the last month, abolishes the Bill of Rights due process, secret arrest, into habeas corpus, and he's asked about it, and he doesn't know anything about it. Here's that clip. There was a, an amendment to a defense authorization bill last week that would allow for the detention of Americans arrested in the United States and uh, to allow the military to hold them indefinitely without charging them or trying them. Um, which I think is pretty dangerous, and I wonder what you think of that. L let me look at the particular authorization, um, and and uh, and I'll make sure on our website we describe uh, reaction to that particular amendment. I, I can tell you this, which is that mm. that there is an effort on the part of radical, violent jihadists to destroy America. They are at war. They declared war against us, and and we are whether we like it or not, we are in we are in wartime with that entity. Radical, violent jihadists, Al-Qaeda and their affiliates around the world are, are attacking us and will attack us and will use weapons of mass destruction if someday they get them. And, and with regards to the authorization, let me take a look at what the, uh, what the legislation itself says. Yeah, thank you. You mean Al-Qaeda set up by the CIA, the folks they used to attack the Serbs and the Libyans and the uh, Egyptians and now the Syrians and, and, and Anwar al-Awlaki who hangs out secretly at the Pentagon, you mean... Those, those, those radical jihadis that you, oh, I want to attack this country. Oh, here's the Al-Qaeda. I'll just, I want to invade your country. Oh, Al-Qaeda, look, it's right there. Oh, I want to invade your country. Oh, Al-Qaeda, it's right there. This pen is Al-Qaeda. I want to attack your country. Al-Qaeda's right there. Oh, I want to take over America. Al-Qaeda is attacking America. I've got to take all your rights away. And I, well, why did you just stick Al-Qaeda right there? Oh, never mind that. Why'd you put the underwear bomber on the plane on Christmas Day two years ago and then try to pass the naked body scanners? Which, Well, let's just not discuss that. It's not patriotic. But, I mean, you made the pin. I mean, you you did it. it. It it works for you. You keep, it's like a little special chess piece. They go, oh, we have the magic piece. We win the game. We move this to your to, to, to here. We're going to uh, blow up this whole country and kill a million people because Al-Qaeda, because they have WMDs and, and Saddam's for Al-Qaeda. Well, Saddam says Al-Qaeda works for you and he hates them. Well, never mind that. He's got nukes. We're going to kill him. 
One last little report here is out of uh, KVUE uh, ABC here in Austin. And they've done this for decades, but the point is they've got other uh, weevil eradication, moth stuff. They spray chemicals in the sky. This one has little cubes that the skunks and raccoons and Easter bunnies eat. Uh, but there's been some connections to this actually causing rabies blooms. I've seen the reports of that. But the Texas Department of State Health Services will drop vaccines from the air Wednesday. It's part of the annual effort to protect the people and livestock from rabies. They'll drop 1.8 million dosages of rabies vaccine over the next month. The vaccines are enclosed in small packets dipped in fish oil and coated with fresh meal crumbles. That sounds pretty tasty, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah, what if your dog goes and eats it? Whatever, they're doing it all for our own good. The point is they're putting it in the food, the water, they're jacking with us, they're playing God. And uh, this may even be a good program or a bad program. The point is there's all sorts of stuff being dropped like manna from heaven down on us. Okay, great job with the crew tonight. That's it for the news. We're going to come back, and we got two interviews for you this evening on InfoWars Nightly News. And remember, we got a lot of enemies and a lot of haters out there, a lot of dirty tricks going on against us. So remember, we always need our war chest swollen with new funds to fight the globalists. So fill our treasure chest, and you know we'll be at the tip of the spear with you. 15-day free trial right now at prisonplanet.tv if you're watching this out there in the hinterland. And, of course, we distribute it out for free for the general public the day after. But those of you that are members of prisonplanet.tv and put up with us, we love you. So thanks for being subscribers. And don't forget all the books and DVDs and T-shirts we have available at InfoWars.com. We'll be right back with this Wednesday, 11th of January, 2012 edition. Stay with us. If you believe in this information and want to support its viral spread. Go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sign Us Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there. Wristbands, citizen rule books in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there. InfoWars.com. It's InfoWars Nightly News. We are back. We're going to go to this short video clip with uh, director and filmmaker uh, Bill Bean um, dealing with Timothy McVeigh a few years before the Oklahoma City bombing at a demolition military base a year after he was supposedly out of the military. Here's that clip, then we're going to Mr. Bean. Hi, my name is Bill Bean. I work in the film industry. On August 3rd, 1993, I was at Camp Grafton, North Dakota. Camp Grafton is a military training academy for the United States Army, the Army Reserve, and the National Guard. The reason I was there was to scout locations for a film project I was working on. I was given a tour of the base it's designated by Colonel Dahl. We were by the uh, motor pool and there were a large group of tanks that were parked there. I saw two soldiers parking a, an armored vehicle. I asked the billeting director if I could go over and interview the soldiers. So I walked over to the armored vehicle. It had a porthole in the back. I entered inside. The soldier who had been driving the vehicle was closing a hatch in the front. When he turned around, he looked at me and he froze. I had my video camera running and I said to him, what's your job? And he looked at me and he said, what? I said, what's your job? He says, I'm nobody, I'm just a parts clerk. On August 3rd, 1993, is when I videotaped and interviewed Timothy McVeigh a year and a half after he was supposedly out of the military completely. I never knew that the soldier in the tank meant a damn thing until 1997 or 1998. I brought my videotape over to a friend of mine who knew my project, and he told me He'd like to see what, I, what I'd shot, what I recently shot. He said to me, uh, let me see it. So I popped the tape in, and it started in the middle where the McVeigh footage was, only I didn't know it was McVeigh at the time. And my friend said to me, where did you shoot this? And I said, well, that was at Camp Grafton in North Dakota. He said, 
do you know who that is? And I said, I don't know, so just some guy in a tank didn't want to talk to me. He says, no, that's Timothy McVeigh. That's the guy who blew up the Murrow Federal Building. And I said to him, are you sure? And he says, yeah. He says, I've been watching the trial all day on TV. Again, that was a clip from the film, A Noble Lie, Oklahoma City, 1995, uh, with one of the most intriguing characters in this entire saga, seeking uh, after the truth. I've interviewed him in many years. Um, Bill Bean is a filmmaker currently living in Chicago, and um, he has made a lot of different you know, films and also acted as well. And we'll get him to basically break down the story of his run-in with um, the supposed mastermind of the Oklahoma City bombing, Timothy McVeigh, uh, which subsequently did get picked up by some major newspapers and magazines in the United States, but never became a big nightly news issue. And it's undoubtedly McVeigh uh, there at a um, demolitions base, a, a army base specializing in demolitions. And uh, the footage is undoubtedly him. And, and this fits into what we know about McVeigh, that he had been sheep dipped or basically uh, taken out of the military and put into clandestine operations, a well-known practice. And joining us to break it down is Bill Bean. Bill, thanks for coming on with us. Sure. Good to be here, Alex. You're the expert on this. Uh, start at the beginning. Okay. I was producing a film. I had written a screenplay and I had gotten to the stage where I had investors that were interested, but they wanted to see something ahead of time. So they knew that they were investing their money correctly. So I went out to the Dakotas to get a lock on locations. I went out to ranches. I went out to farms. I talked to people. One of the people I talked to was Jeff Esslinger at the North Dakota Film Office. Jeff read my screenplay, Jeff uh, talked to me about what I wanted to shoot, and he was sending me to a couple of different locations, and he added uh, that I could go to a military base because I had a, several military bases in my screenplay. I had actually told him that I really wasn't that interested. I had a lock on a couple of other bases, but he said, why don't you just show up? If you don't want to use it, that's fine. It's right on your way. So I contacted the uh, Camp Grafton in North Dakota. It's a military training academy. What they teach there is explosives and demolition and bridge building. And I had a meeting prepared <clears throat> with a Colonel Dahl. Colonel Dahl was the superintendent of Camp Grafton. I videotaped Colonel Dahl talking to me and stating that I was at Camp Grafton to scout locations for my film. And then Colonel Dahl turned me over to the billeting director, uh, by a man by the name of Paul Osser. Uh, Paul actually took me on the tour of the base. The tour lasted, oh, about two hours or so. Uh, we, we looked at any location I wanted to look at. We went to some general locations. Uh, we went to the uh, rec room, the mess hall. I videotaped all the locations. Then we got to some of the more interesting places. Uh, we went to the motor pool where they had gigantic earth moving equipment. Uh, we went to the armory, which I actually got a kick out of. Uh, I didn't really know what it was. It was just a big vaulted door. And I said to the uh, to the uh, soldiers in charge there, I said, gee, could I go in there? And they said, oh, OK. So they opened up the armory. They had to unlock a door like you do at a vaulted safe in a bank. I went inside. I videotaped that. Uh, we went over to the communications room. Uh, then we went outside of the motor pool. And there was a long string of tanks, um, probably the length of a football field, uh, various kinds, various makes. Uh, in fact, I was informed that uh, several of the tanks uh, had been captured in the Gulf War. This was the first Gulf War. And uh, some of them were Russian, I believe. So uh, while I was videotaping that location, I saw a flatbed, a very large flatbed, with two soldiers, one soldier inside and one soldier outside directing. So the, the armored vehicle... I've been corrected. I used to call it a tank, and people have corrected me and say, well, no, that's not a tank. It's an armored vehicle. Okay, uh, I accept the correction. It's an armored vehicle. 
and the one soldier was inside and he took the took the armored vehicle off the flatbed and it stalled out once it got on the ground. I kept videotaping and it stalled out again. So rather than quit taping, I did a very slow 360 degree pan in all directions, establishing right then and there that I was at Camp Grafton and that this, this armored vehicle was parked there at Camp Grafton. The billeting director that I was with was on the phone. And uh, since I had been able to go anywhere else I wanted to go, I said, gee, could I go uh, interview those guys? And he nodded yes. So I walked over, and when the, um, when the armored vehicle was parked, I uh, entered it through a large porthole in the rear. I crouched in the entrance, and because the, uh, the vehicle had been running, uh, the individual parking the vehicle uh, wasn't aware that I was inside the uh, the vehicle. Yeah, you went in the rear hatch, and, and, and to be clear, this is this is a few years before the Oklahoma City bombing, but about a year after. Uh, I'm going for memory, so correct me if I'm wrong. But about a year after he'd supposedly been out of the military, and it matches photos from around the time with him being a bit thinner. Uh, but if you look at the hands, the rest of the body, I um, mean, I've studied this video closely over the years. It it it. It, I'd say 99.9% .9 this is Tim McVeigh. What's your view on that? <clears throat> oh, oh, yeah, there's no question that it's Tim McVeigh. Uh, I, I took the shot. Uh, I froze, when I looked at the video years later, I froze it right when he turned around. And I was able to, through computers, to put up specific shots of Tim McVeigh from that time. In fact, his military uh, shot where he is in the military uniform with the military cap I placed right exactly next to it, plus a shot taken uh, when he was younger and he had longer hair. And when you put the three in a line, it is uh, Timothy McVeigh, no question. Um, the, the one problem we had was you couldn't see a name patch on there. But you could read on the on the left shoulder was a patch that took us quite a while to figure out what it was. But it was the North Dakota National Guard patch, which is like five arrows pointing up. So he was wearing a North Dakota uh, National Guard patch. And uh, so I got the shot on my tape is rolling. I'm looking directly at him and he sort of freezes there for a second. And I casually say to him, uh, what's your job? And he just sort of looks at me and he goes, what? And I said, what's your job? And he sorts, he tries to push his way past me, but because I'm crouched in the entrance, he can't get by. So he crouches in the corner out of camera range and he says, I'm just a parts clerk. And uh, I didn't really know what to make of that. I thought it was kind of insulting because he's not just a parts clerk, he's parking a tank and he must be a soldier there doing something, but I decided not to push him on it. So I, I said to him, oh, you're just parking this one, huh? And he says, yeah, basically. And then I let him pass by through the porthole. Now, uh, there's one interesting thing about this, which a lot of people miss. A lot of people say, well, how do I know that that was, maybe it's Tim McVeigh, which everybody agrees once they have seen the, uh, seen the tape and once they've read the forensics report, which uh, Professor Blomgren at the University of Utah the uh, voice, uh, speech, and pathology department did a forensics test comparing the person in the tank with a known uh, uh, 60 Minutes interview with McVeigh. And Professor Blomgren contacted me saying he's run all the tests. He will testify in a court of law as an expert that this is Timothy McVeigh, and he's sure of it. Now, Inside the tank, there was a plastic, uh, an unbreakable glass plastic turret right at the top. And for a fraction of a second after McVeigh passes me, I put the camera up into the turret and I shoot through. I, I couldn't get my head up there to shoot it. I just shot it through with the camera looking through the glass. And there you see the same thing I did the 360 degree angle of just like two minutes before exact same uh, trucks are parked there, the cloud structure in the, si the sky, it's all the same.
Well, so Bill, if we go back when I first interviewed you, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago, uh, you know, so much more has come out confirming the true story, the true horror of what took place there in Oklahoma City. Uh, and, and, and of course, at Infowars.com, we carry the film A Noble Lie. That's really the only modern, well-done film. Uh, just amazing uh, information, the interviews in it, and, and you're an important piece of that. Uh, but uh, pulling back from this, separate from from the context of all the other pieces of the puzzle, what is so important in your own words, because I know it's important, but I want your perspective about your piece of information. Why is this so important that Timothy McVeigh was in the military a year after they claim he was out? Well, Timothy McVeigh served in the first Gulf War, and then he supposedly totally left the military by May of 1992. All the military records say that he was out. He was never again in the military. He wasn't in the Army. He wasn't in the Army Reserve. He was not in the National Guard. His activities at this time were when he was meeting with, they say, right-wing types or militia types or anti-government types, and they totally lose track. The FBI uh, and everyone concerned says somehow he totally leaves visibility for like a two-month period. And it is during this time, on August 3rd, 1993, that I videotaped Timothy McVeigh at Camp Grafton, uh, establishing that he was in uniform, parking a tank, and he was in a tank corps when he was in the military. He knew about tanks. And if you go to that base, I was told, you go to that bank base to learn to blow things up and to be a bridge builder. And I videotaped the class where you you learn about explosives and demolition. And I, I actually, as just as a fluke, videotaped the books on the tables of the explosives and demolition uh, books that were there. So this establishes absolutely that there is a lie by the United States government, by the military, by the FBI. The FBI could not be so stupid not to know this, that McVeigh was in the military, probably under an assumed name. Uh, when I did the story and Hustler picked up on it, Hustler had their uh, investigators go to Camp Grafton and request information as to whether or not Timothy McVeigh was at Camp Grafton. And the statement from the military was that there are no records that state Timothy McVeigh was at Camp Grafton either on the day I was there and videotaped him or at any other time. So he was never, ever supposed to be at Camp Grafton, and yet I videotaped him, and it proves that he was there most probably under an assumed name. So there's a cover then for, for Timothy McVeigh, and this ties in with his statements and his family statements that he was working for the government surreptitiously, secretly, pretending to be anti-government, anti-American. And that's what all the experts from every angle have basically found and confirmed. That's what the entire uh, you know, images that we get with the Elohim City and the Southern Poverty Law Center and all of it. And he was going around the country. That's what in sworn affidavits Larry Nichols, as you know, has said. He was going around the country, infiltrating, getting data. And then a few days before, he got angry about the target. Uh, and about the daycare center and things like that. Uh, and so they went ahead and I guess set him up kind of like Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, uh, to be clear, The uh, Noble Lies, an excellent film. They've got another extended edition coming out soon that's uh, reportedly gonna have your footage in it. And they sent us just a short clip, but I was able to go to YouTube and pull up from you know a decade ago when we first put it out on local TV. And then since it's been on YouTube, a grainier copy of uh, you know the full thing of, of showing what you described of uh, you there talking to him. Uh, in the armored vehicle, uh, but uh, there's no doubt this is McVeigh. Uh, and uh, where do you go from here? Because I mean, your piece of the puzzle is so important. Where do you go from here? Are there any websites people can visit to learn more about your particular work? Uh, and any other points that you think are important to relay? Well, you can go to uh, A Noble Lie, and uh, you can see it on YouTube, or you can go to the website, and uh, you can. You can purchase the DVD. You can see the footage of me being interviewed, plus the footage of McVeigh on YouTube. Um, Timothy McVeigh is definitely there. It proves he's there. You ask me where I go. You know, I was harassed for many years without really understanding why. It wasn't until 
McVeigh's trial that I actually understood that this was McVeigh in the tank. Uh, events took place in my life. <clears throat> I was I was harassed. I had hang up phone calls. The uh, the people that were investing in my film pulled out. People would say to me, "Did you make somebody mad? What's going on?" And I would have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, it wasn't until not only that I saw that I had McVeigh on the tape, but until a couple of years later when I realized that this was the clincher piece, that this was the piece that established that McVeigh worked for the government, he wasn't some lone wolf nut hating the government, and that his actions were controlled. As he himself told uh, Terry Nichols and various other people, he didn't choose the targets, the targets were chosen for him, uh, he was set up with people, people were, were instructed to deal with him, he was instructed to, to go along and cooperate and play the game as, as part of an anti-American uh, right-wing nut or militia person or just a, a, a crazy person, but that was never the case. He was acting under orders and he admitted this to, to several people. Uh, I'm, well, that's I'm, right, and we also have just the entire, you know, the entire program we know was a false flag event, as the film Noble Lie and other research proves. But uh, in closing, when did you first discover that you had footage of McVeigh? Because you'd shot this years before out scouting. Uh, I mean, you may have answered it earlier, but just I mean, when did you first realize? Wait a minute, I've got <clears throat> footage of this guy. Well, uh, I shot it on August 3rd, 1993, and I didn't realize that it was McVeigh in the tank until like 1997 when I had uh, two hours of footage that I'd shot of various locations and people, and I was showing it to a friend of mine, and it just happened that this part in the tank of Camp Grafton came up, and my friend says, wait a minute, what is this? He says, well, where did you shoot this? I said, oh, that was at Camp Grafton in 93. And he says, don't you know who that is? And I said, I, well, I don't know. He didn't identify himself. And my friend told me, that's Timothy McVeigh. That's the guy who blew up the Murrow Federal Building. And since then, I've talked to people. I've talked to VZ Lawton, who is a survivor of the Oklahoma City bombing, who attended the trial. And he establishes this is the man I saw. This is Timothy McVeigh. I've talked to Congressman Charles Key, congressman from the state of Oklahoma, who also establishes this is this is Timothy McVeigh. Uh, so this is the clincher piece, at least my part of the clincher piece. No, it's a key. It's it's one of the most important pieces, and it just brings it all together, and it confirms all the other amazing evidence. Uh, Bill Bean, thank you so much for spending time with us, and I just want to again thank the filmmakers as well for helping get all the great researchers and people that have contributed uh, and, and, and and putting it all together in one film, A Noble Lie. And uh, I also want to thank you for your courage under that harassment. A lot of other people would have would have backed off, but uh, we well, well, you know, Alex, uh, over a hundred people were murdered that day. Little children were murdered. I have had people say to me over the years, you know, why don't you just, I actually had somebody say to me, why don't you just send the tape to Camp Grafton and then maybe they'll leave you alone. Now that's not what we do in life. We stand up for what's right. If we don't, life will only get worse. You're right, things have gotten pretty bad because a lot of folks just think if you give in to evil uh, that it's gonna back off, but that's not how it works. Bill Bean, look forward to speaking to you again, hopefully on the radio. And again, we salute you, my friend. Thank you, and I salute you too. Wow, uh, just an amazing individual. We're gonna go to break and come back with another amazing patriot, and of course, that's uh, Stuart Rose, the founder of Oath Keepers, to look at the NDAA and the nightmare police state unfolding in America under the guise of protecting us from terrorism, but we all know, unfortunately, who the terrorists are, and denying that fact isn't gonna make it go away, as Bill Bean just said. We'll be right back, it's InfoWars Nightly News. Ron Paul would be very dangerous for this country because he wants to bring troops like you back from your posts from all over the world. Well, I think it would be even more dangerous to start nitpicking wars with other countries. Someone like Iran, Israel is more than capable of. All right, we just lost our tech connection, unfortunately. A question for you. Do you recognize this guy? He may be the best kept secret in the race for president. He may be the best kept secret.
First, hit the mute button whenever Ron Paul talks. The man's an ignoramus, and, and his views are entitled to zero <laughs> respect. I love what I'm doing. In fact, I have a great club that's 15 minutes away. By the way, Ron Paul cannot get elected. I'm sorry to tell you. The isolationist wing of Ron Paul. The fact is, his views on foreign policy, I think, are stunningly dangerous for the survival of the United States. He's unelectable at the end of the day. You wouldn't support a nominee like that. Um, there are nominees uh, that I'm uh, not enthusiastic about. They haven't gotten the nomination, not likely to get the nomination. So you're ruling Ron Paul out. I am. <laughs> Freedom! Now, the question is, The cheering is happening here for Ron Paul in the stadium. We're at war here in this country, internally, and this is where our biggest enemies are, and we need to get up off our ass and do something about it. So I will sing Ron Paul until the last ballot is cast. I will not stop fighting. So Ron Paul becomes president, the Republicans, the Democrats, the media, they're out of business. Their Ponzi scheme on America is over. It's done. In Washington, D.C., we frequently have resolutions being passed that rubber stamp the foreign policy of intervention. But they always get passed usually nearly unanimously, maybe there's a few, and sometimes there's only one opposing the resolution. Our campaign got more money from the troops than all the other candidates put together. Freedom! Don't get involved in these wars and just bring our troops home. The more we threat, the more we intimidate, the more we want to bomb people, the more we're leading into another fiasco like Vietnam. We trade with Vietnam now. That's a much better way than trying to impose our will on Vietnam by going over there and dropping bombs. So I would say that uh, this just points out again that we have a very, very poor foreign policy in the Middle East. Holding up my sign. Ron Paul for president. That's right, folks. t -Mot. out here, boots on the ground. They're building up this case like, just like we did in Iraq. Build up the war propaganda. There was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and they had nuclear weapons, and we had to go in. I'm sure you supported that war as well. Okay. It's time we quit this. It's time. It's trillions of dollars we're spending on these wars. A true patriot defends liberty and the people. But you know, some of our opponents have labeled us, and I just want to talk about that for a minute. They call us dangerous. The true patriot will repeal the Patriot Act. Oh, gosh, there's so many things to say. Representative Paul, it's a pleasure to, to, to have you on today. You are such a breath of fresh air. You must be an endangered species down there in Texas. That's all that I can say, first of all. I will stick to my guns if put in that office and protect the Constitution. So who are his supporters? We're not talking about 10,000. We're not talking about 100,000. We're talking about many American millions of people in this country and around the world who have heard this message. And it's growing, and it seems like even if they try, they can't stop us. Our campaign is all about freedom, prosperity, and peace. And we are back now with the conclusion of this edition of InfoWars Nightly News with another patriot. And uh, before we go to Stuart Rhodes, I thought I would read uh, this wordy quote uh, from George Washington, because every day we're going to have a patriot or a control freak quote. We're going to uh, give you quotes from the globalist and other controlled freaks throughout history and quotes from patriots who stood up for human liberty. And here's the George Washington quote, real patriots who may resist the intrigues of the favorite are liable to become suspected and odious, while its tools and dupes usurp the applause and confidence of the people to surrender their interest. George Washington. And basically that's saying dupes and sellouts 
will never stand up against corruption, so they will be given the largesse of the government chest or of the tyrant, but those who won't go along with it will end up being labeled uh, as the terrorist and being rounded up. Uh, so that's basically what George Washington uh, had to say for us on that point. Now, I had Stuart Rhodes, founder of Oath Keepers, on the radio for about an hour today, getting into the history uh, of military commissions and secret arrest of citizens and basically martial law in America. Now that the NDAA is law, and uh, he's the founder and director of Oath Keepers. He served as a U.S. Army paratrooper until disabled in a rough terrain parachuting accident during a night jump. He's a, uh, a firearms instructor and a former member of Representative Ron Paul's D.C. staff. Uh, he's also written for SWAT magazine. He's a graduate from Yale Law School, where he uh, won one of their most prestigious awards, Solving the Puzzle of Enemy Combatant Status. It won Yale's uh, Miller Prize for Best Paper on the Bill of Rights. And he also was taught for the U.S. military history at Yale. Uh, and um, it just goes on from there. He's a real expert on uh, the dangers of applying the rules of war to the American people. And he joins us to, 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 to condense the history um, of where our republic has come from and where it's going, the same, the same problems we face today we've been through before. And the tyrants are pretty lazy. They just rewrite old stuff that's already been overturned. And then I wanted him to basically have a call to the police and military to choose who they will serve. Because the NDAA, though we fought it, has really done something good. It's a silver lining. And that is, it's really proven for everybody that we do have a criminal government at the top and that they really are tyrants. And it's woken a lot of people up. So the wheat is being separated from the uh, chaff. Stuart with OathKeepers.org, great to have you here with us. You've got the floor, my friend, for the next 20 minutes. Tell us uh, where we stand. Well, the bottom line is, is what's happening to us right now is exactly what happened to the founding fathers that compelled them to take up arms in defense of their traditional rights as Englishmen and also in defense of their natural rights as human beings. And the exact same causes and grievances that they suffered, we are suffering now. Among those listed in our Declaration of Independence were denial of jury trial and the attempt to make the military superior to the civil power, and also the claimed power to whisk a colonist over overseas to be tried in England rather than in front of a jury of their peers in the, in the colonies. And one more charge against the king was that he was attempting to subject them to a jurisdiction foreign to their constitution. And this bill and the, the prior actions of two administrations now, both Bush administrations and the Obama administrations, do all of those. The claim is, is that the powers of the commander-in-chief during wartime apply not just to a foreign enemy, but also apply to Americans and that Americans can be treated exactly the same as a goat herder in Iraq. If a goat herder in Iraq is accused of stealing a neighbor's goat, well, he'll get a normal Iraqi trial. But if the U.S. military thinks he's, he's a member of the resistance, then they will just pick him up. Or if they think he's supporting the resistance, they'll just pick him up and put him into military jurisdiction and he'll wind up in Guantanamo. And the claim is, is that they can do the exact same thing here at home. Our Constitution, from the very beginning, has had a sharp line of separation between what can be done to a foreign enemy and what can be done to an American citizen. A, an Iraqi cannot be accused of treason because they don't owe any loyalty to the United States. A U.S. citizen or lawful resident, on the other hand, can be accused of treason because we do owe loyalty to the United States. And that's exactly what's supposed to be done with an American who's accused of making war against the United States or aiding its enemy. As the Article 3, Section 3 treason clause in the Constitution plainly states, it defines treason as consisting only in levying war against the United States or adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. And it says, no person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to, to the same overt act or on confession in open court. So there are extra protections. There's a requirement for two witnesses, not just one, and not secret evidence or secret witnesses, two witnesses and or confession in open court. Because the founders had experienced denial of jury trial 
um, parliament had passed laws that stripped away jury trial in certain cases. They had passed laws to expand the jurisdiction of the admiralty courts, which were their military tribunals back then. So they had suffered those abuses. And to prevent that from ever happening again, Article 3, Section 2 mandates that all crimes must be tried by jury. And then Article 3, Section 3 defines the crime of treason and tells you exactly what must be done and it provides additional procedural protections. And this is what's being violated right now by the president and also by Congress and also by the courts. The U.S. Supreme Court, unfortunately, in 1942, threw the Bill of Rights in, in the trash can and authorized military trial of a U.S. citizen. That is the precedent they've grabbed a hold of now and are using today. And the modern uh, Supreme Court in 2004 in the Hamdi case, the case of a U.S. citizen being detained, um, reaffirmed and grabbed that old World War II precedent. It's totally illegitimate. It directly violates the treason clause, and it violates the rest of the Bill of Rights, the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth Amendments. You have a right to a grand jury indictment. You have a right to a jury trial in the state in which the crime is alleged to have been committed. And Justice Scalia in his dissent in Hamdi is spot on. He said, this is ridiculous. You're directly violating the treason clause. You're violating the Constitution. What you're doing is not under the Constitution, it's illegitimate, and that's why he dissented. And so what's going on right now is that everything the founders put in place, everything your forefathers bled and fought and died for, and everything they put in the Bill of Rights to make sure that the, the government could not escape the chains of the Constitution, that's all being turned on its head, as though we were in Nazi Germany or Stalinist Russia. The same thing our forefathers fought against, fascism is now on our shores and being imposed upon us by domestic enemies of our constitution. And the message to all the military out there is that just like I did when I served as a young paratrooper, when, whatever your branch is, when you swore that oath to support and defend the constitution, it was against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And the founders put that requirement of that oath in the Constitution itself in Article, in Article um, 6. They mandated that you must take an oath, and everyone must take an oath. All the, every person in the, in the branch in, in the government takes an oath. Unfortunately, all three branches now have directly violated their oath. They are oath breakers. They are violating the Constitution. And, and frankly, what they're doing is treason against the Constitution because they are making war on the American people. There is no power. Nowhere in the Constitution is Congress given the authority and the power to declare war on the American people or to wage war on the American people. And quite the opposite. There's a separation between what can be done to a foreign enemy and what can be done to us. That is now being torn down. You must defend it. This is your test. If you do not stand up and defend the Constitution, if you do not refuse any such orders and be prepared to defend the rights of the people, if you don't do that, then what you will have become is an oath breaker and a traitor to your country. And, and God have mercy on your soul, because a, an oath is a sacred obligation under God that you will do as you said you would. It's a promise. And everything your forefathers fought and died for will be, have been destroyed. Um, I know a, a World War II veteran who's 101st Airborne. He fought at the Battle of the Bulge. He's 91 years old. And I talked to him the other day, and, and, and he is angry at the fact that everything he fought against, that he went overseas along with his brothers to go fight against fascism, and now he sees it happening here. And so if you let this come to America and you let it happen on your watch, then you will have – you might as well go down to, to Arlington and spit on the graves of every war dead in this country's history from 1775 on will have been for nothing if you let this happen. So you have to do what you swore you would do. You have to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. You have to have the same courage you would have in combat. You're willing to go and fight and die like I was when I served and as I still am right now as a veteran. You have to have the same dedication and willingness to give your life in defense of the Constitution as you would in defense of your buddies in combat. It's the same thing. And as a veteran, I got to tell you that you will not – 
just slide into the Fourth Reich because us veterans will not let that happen. We will resist, and if it comes to it, we will fight. We will exhaust, like our forefathers, we will exhaust all peaceful remedies to, to um, defend our rights. But if pushed up against the wall in the same way the founders were with a long train of abuses, which is what's happening now, we will fight also. And so that's our message from the veterans to the, to the current serving is that you will have to kill us all. There are 25 million veterans in this country, and if you violate your oath and attempt to detain American citizens or apply the laws of war, including just killing us, if you try to do that, we will fight. Stuart. You have to kill us all. Very powerful, Stuart. I just want to add a caveat here that humans, as we pointed out today on the radio, we go through the same cycles. Doesn't matter what color, what culture, humans are humans. We do the same stuff over and over again. Every historian, every anthropologist, every sociologist, I got chills just now, admits we're going into a very decadent cycle. The whole world, top universities recognize America is becoming fascistic. The NDAA does do you know, what we say it does, even though there's these denials because they want to have these powers, but they don't want to admit it so we can have a political fight over it. They want to stealthily implement this. And I get so many emails and calls and comments on the street of, well, what can we do? Or, well, I have nothing to hide. Okay, it's a tyranny, but I'm not fighting against it. A tyranny is like a lion eating gazelles. It's eating gazelles because that's what it does. It, you know, like a, a gazelle doesn't say, well, I'm a friendly little gazelle, so the lion isn't going to try to eat me. This is what tyrannies do. And you notice they're taking the military death benefits through fraud. They're stealing houses that people have paid for through fraud, the, the big banks. Uh, they're, the government's caught laundering drug money and shipping drugs in and shipping guns into Mexico to blame the Second Amendment. And the proofs of it, of the corruption, just, it's luminous. Special interests came in, took over the government, and are doing whatever they want. That's tyranny. And we have let it happen. And now we're so far down the line, the criminals know we're waking up, so they're trying to pass laws to declare people that are standing up for freedom and common sense and due process as the terrorist. And we have all the training manuals. So people have to understand, tyrannies will reduce us to despotism. They will reduce us to poverty like a third world country because that's the nature of what these people do. And their fruits are bondage and servitude and pain and poverty. And... Uh, We've got to turn this around now, and I, I'd like you to speak to the point, to get your perspective and see if you agree, that we fought NDAA, but as you and others have pointed out, they were already implementing this stuff. Now, the fact that it's so naked is really sending out a clarion call, and a lot of people who are on the fence, I'm heartened to see, aren't groveling in fear. They're seeing the illegitimacy of this. They're seeing the enemy fly their Jolly Roger openly. It's piratical. It's openly criminal. And so now the choice is so clear. That's right. The choice is, is in front of you. It's it's so plain. And it is building on what, what two administrations have already claimed and have already done. President Bush detained two American citizens as unlawful combatants. Obama has done even better by killing American citizens. And their claim is they can do that at will to any American. And just by by designating you on their say-so alone as an unlawful combatant, now you're in the military system. If you want to challenge that designation, it'll be a military judge that will determine your status. And that's what the NDAA says in Section 1024. It says that determinations of status shall be done by a military judge, not a grand jury, not a jury of your peers in front of a civilian court. A military judge. That's totally illegitimate. So it's in your face that the time is right now. You do not have – the option of deferring to some future point your decision. You need to decide right now which side you're on. Either you're on the side of liberty for which this country was founded. The whole point of America is freedom. As our Declaration of Independence says, the only justifiable purpose for government is to secure our natural God-given rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And whensoever any government violates those ends, it becomes illegitimate, and we have a right to throw it off, and that's why our founders rebelled. And so we're in the same position now. We have a very narrow window of opportunity to fix this by 
by peaceful political means through nullification as individuals, as towns, counties, and states, and also by the military nullifying. Sheriff's departments and military must nullify and refuse. And, and while we're at it, sweep all of these oath breakers out of office. But if that fails, then the only last remedy we will have is if the U.S. military refuses and does a mass stand down like what happened in 1989 East Germany. And message to the military is, if the East Germans can do it, a bunch of guys who grew up first under fascism, under Nazis, and then they grew up under communists, if they could do what was right in 1989 when the wall fell by refusing to fire on their own citizens, then you can do what's right. All you have to do is remember your oath and read the Constitution, read the very plain text of Article 3 and the Bill of Rights, and then do what's right. You already swore the oath. You long ago lost the option of ducking out and just following orders. If you do so, like I said before, you will be spitting on the graves of all of our war dead, and you and your children, you'll be leaving your children to tyranny, to darkness. Well, that's the thing about tyranny historically. You're a historian and somebody who's written, you know, award winning papers on it, but the general public who hasn't looked at it, I challenge them to. Not only is it riveting and entertaining, it, it's, it's humans act the same. We have the same life cycles, live the same amount, act the same, do the same cycles. History does repeat. And you better learn it or you're doomed to repeat it. And folks, it's bloody. And when you look at what's being set up, they're not setting a tyranny up just because they want all this power. They're doing it because they want to make us slaves. They're doing it because they enjoy it. And you know, you look at the East Germans, they had lived under absolute war and such tyranny that it was so austere and so Spartan, they were clear-minded and started to, to see what was happening. As you know, the, uh, the East German former officer who was part of the stand down, the colonel you, you uh, uh, helped us get on, uh, pointed out, they went from absolute tyranny at the end of World War II to people slowly demanding rights. He says, America is going from incredible liberty, sliding in the opposite direction. And so we've got the entertainment, the football games, the hot wings, all of this you know, wrapping paper you know, that makes it look sparkly and nice, but under it is classical tyranny, whereas they were so Spartan, they could really see it. And I think that's the disadvantage we've got is that the mind control now used in America is so sophisticated. How do you break through that, Stuart, A, and B, why should we be concerned they're setting up a tyranny? What do governments always do when they set this up? Well, as, as, as founding father George Mason said, a, a, a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles is what must be done to preserve liberty. And the founding generation rebelled not just against what was happening to them, but also against the claim to power. They didn't wait for it to get to its logical conclusion and to be used in the broadest sense. They rebelled against the principle, the claim that they could rule over them in all cases whatsoever, the claim that they could set aside jury trial and try them in front of a court of admiralty. They rebelled long before they felt the full effects. Because they of were the historians abuse. and were into research, they knew every they time knew. tyrants declare a tyranny, they intend to use it. Right, as, as Patrick Henry said, you know, what purpose does this, this martial array have? It's meant for us. The chains they're forging are meant for us. They can be for no other. They understood human history. They had seen the history of the Star Chamber in England where you had secret trials uh, with secret evidence and, and torture and coerced confessions. They understood all of that. They understood the reason why. 600 years of struggle to establish the right to jury trial and, and the right of habeas corpus. They understood that history, and they knew that tyrants would always, or, or willful men of power, would always be tempted to, to throw away any restraints on their power and to use that power in a willful manner against anyone who opposed them. They had seen it throughout history over and over. And let's be clear, Greece on. all over the world, the Magna Carta and U.S. model of juries and due process, that has become the model. And now America, where it all really crystallized, is becoming the model of torture and secret arrest. I mean, it is a total 
reversal of what we stand for. I mean, the Bill of Rights, Constitution, Declaration of Independence, common law is the republic, is what made us different, not perfect, but because we never implemented it fully, but, but better than all the others. And, and whereas other parts of the world are moving towards liberty, we are plunging like a falling star into the black hole abyss of despotism. How do we reverse it? Well, just, just by realizing that, realizing that we are the defenders of Western civilization and our Bill of Rights is the crown jewel of our republic and it is the cornerstone of our republic and it's the high watermark of Western civilization. If you let it fall, then Western civilization will fall because that's what defines the West is individual liberty, is restraint on power. And all the struggle over thousands of years will be snuffed out. We back into, into blackness, like during the Dark Ages. So we have to stand and defend it. You're defending the West. Al-Qaeda cannot destroy the United States. Radical Islamicism cannot destroy the United States. Only we can destroy ourselves from the inside out. And that's what's happening. We are going down the same road the Germans went down. The Nazis scared them with the, the fear of terrorists, with communist terrorism, the Reichstag fire. And that's how they got the German people to sacrifice their, their liberty on the altar of security. So we Americans will be different because there are Americans who will not be willing to, to do that. Exactly. Sacrifice. Anybody that comes to you and says there's a physical threat, give your rights up, they're obviously the author of the terror or they're the ones using it. That's the definition of terrorism is threatening something for political or economic gain. And, and, and I watch these politicians invoke fear and the crowds hiss and get into being scared. How do we go from land of the free, home of the brave to just this religion of fear, it's so ridiculous. I mean, it is, it is so alien. It, it, it is so disgusting, Stuart. I want to ask you about the tens of thousands of police and military you talk to. I tend to criticize police as we see the examples of abuse magnified. And I understand that is a minority, but the system is trying to encourage that. But especially with military, though, to, to say that the awakening is, is, is at warp speed or hyperbolic or exponential is putting it lightly. Again, I, if you go back 10, 12 years ago, I was very negative about where we were going. So I'm not a cheerleader here. I am seeing explosive awakening, but there's a danger. The system is aware of that. Just look at Ron Paul. We never even got into him today. The system throws everything they've got now and it still can't stop somebody. That's the barometer for them. And uh, so, so break down, how fast is the awakening you're seeing, or do you disagree and, 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 and say it's not happening this fast? And how, how is Ron Paul a bellwether or weather vane or barometer of that? Well, I think, I think the, we have two great weapons in, in, our, in our hands. One is, well, one is the truth in our own history and our own, their own constitution. And but the second one is the internet and freedom of speech. And that's what's galvanized Ron Paul's campaign and also the work of others like Chuck Baldwin, who's running for lieutenant governor in Montana. And you know what you do, what I'm trying to do, all of that is dependent upon freedom of speech, which is why they're going to try to shut down the internet with SOPA. That's like the enemy combatant status for websites. They can just designate your website an enemy combatant and black bag it. Yeah, they know we're no, waking no up, process. so they're moving on every front, so we better make hay while the sun shines. That's right. And, and it is, we will win in the end. Provided we have enough time, the truth will prevail. We will win, and they know that, and that's why they want to shut down the internet because we are reaching the troops, whether they like it or not. We are reaching the police officers, and we are reaching our fellow citizens, and we are waking them up. And for, like I said from the very beginning of Oath Keepers, I know from my own personal experience in the military that those who serve do have honor and courage. But what's happening is, is the powers that be are relying on them being ignorant, not teaching them what they should know, their own history. We all went through public schools, we weren't taught our history. They rely and use that ignorance and then they twist it and turn it and try to tell you this is all lawful, this is all okay. That, oh yeah, this is what you always do with enemies in wartime and including US citizens, which is total nonsense. So they're, they're trying to get you to believe a lie, a great lie. 
And so what you have to do is just open your eyes and see the truth. Go read the Constitution, read the, what, what the founders fought against, read what they said when they, when they founded this, this, this country, when they, when they founded the Declaration of Independence, when they, when they wrote the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution, read what they were doing and why they did it. And when you do that, once your eyes are opened, you will not be fooled. And I do have confidence in you to have the courage to do what's right. I know you got courage. Once you know what's right, use that courage and stand on your oath. You have an obligation to do what's right. You're right. Once you know what it is. But unfortunately, it has been pointed out that moral courage is rarer than physical courage uh, to go against the peer pressure. But I see that peer pressure uh, cracking right now. I think it's important, again, to go back to where I started, though, Stuart. And I want you to close on this and make any other points. Um, uh, you know, that you'd like to the millions of folks in the aggregate that'll end up watching and listening to this. When you look at the landscape, you look at history. That's why those of us that study history are so horrified. People need to understand there's not really a choice. I mean, there's the illusionary choice, the, uh, this barrage that you can go along with the system or you can stand for freedom. And, and the system sells the idea that standing for freedom is the dangerous course. But if you look at history, going with the tyrants is the absolute dangerous course. People say, Alex, you've got so much courage to do what you do, and you know, and, or you could have sold out and all this stuff. Sell out to something that's so destructive? I mean, this is a nasty tyranny. It's only going to get progressively worse. It's, it's like selling out and not cutting out cancer. It's going to be hard to go get the cancer cut out. It's going to be a lot harder to die from it. And, and as people need to understand, there's not really a choice. I mean, if you study history and know this stuff like Stuart and I do, or Ron Paul does, and we're not that smart of guys. We just learned about real important stuff and started researching it. Anybody can learn about this. It's history. It's who we are. It's, it's the human struggle. It's the human condition since day one, since zero hour. And every day is zero hour. And, and we're here now, and there's no choice. You've got to choose freedom. The new world order is real, the tyranny. All of it's now in your face. We've got to jump on these people because despite all their fiat money and all their derivatives and all their media whores, we didn't mind being ridiculed 30, 40, 50 years ago, 10 years ago. We warned people. We knew the globalist program. From, they were so arrogant, their documents were public. So we preached the enemy battle plan. Now it's happening. And, and now those time bombs, those seeds have been planted. But they are committed. Now, that's what I'm saying. This big collision is here. This, this great time is now here. We're in the fight because people were willing to be imprisoned and killed and tortured and set up. Forty years ago, if you talked about this, they would kill you they, in many cases because they were scared of the info ever getting out. Now it's out. They're trying to just manage it. So people need to understand people died and were imprisoned and ridiculed and attacked and, and, and old men and women handed out pamphlets 50 years ago about the coming New World Order and were laughed at, you know, out in the rain in front of, you know, buildings so that, so that we could build on them. We've got an infrastructure a thousand times what it was just 20 years ago. Our infrastructure is going to continue to grow. I know I'm ranting here, Stuart. It's just that if you think about the work everybody did before us just so we'd have a launch pad to be able to challenge these people, we better use it, Stuart. Absolutely, and of course, look at look at all the the blood and 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 sacrifice of our forefathers and everyone who struggled for human freedom for hundreds of years. I mean, all of it is on the line right now, and now it's our turn. It's our watch. It's our turn in the breach to stand up, shoulder to shoulder, and to defend the rights of our children and our children's children. Because if we don't then they will be lost in darkness. And as you said, it's an illusion to think that you're going to be safe. Go and you should all go and read the Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn. He talks about what happened in the USSR under communism, under, under a tyranny. Everybody was at, was at risk. Stalin purged, you know, mindlessly purged officers out of the military and in the police. No one was safe. It was it was an absolute tyranny over everybody, an arbitrary, bloodthirsty, you know. A never... raw exercise of power they called the Red Terror. Right. And and look at look at the French Revolution. Same thing happened there. People who were chopping off the heads of the royalty and, and the priests, they wound up being 
they're having their heads chopped off also. They succumb to the guillotine too because it been turned into the reign of terror. It happens over and over again throughout history. It's unrestrained, raw power. That's what it is. That's right. And Good it's, people it's have to get together with constitutions, with conventions for the common defense of basic rights so that evil power can never amass in gangs to overrun us. It's so simple. And if you, th if you cast it down, which is now happening, you open the gates to hell. And it's happening, people. The gates are now open, and we're standing at the gate facing the New World Order. And it's, it's I tell you, it's going to be an incredible confrontation, Stuart. It is. But all we have to do is remember who we are. We are not Germans. We're not peasants in China. We're not, you know, peasants in Russia. We have a legacy and a history of fighting for liberty. Americans have always fought for liberty, and we will fight again. And so we will not be the Fourth Reich. We will not let that happen, not without a fight. So once again, choose now who you serve. You'll either be on the side of we the people or you'll be a traitor on the other side, like the loyalists, like the redcoats that our forefathers fought against, and we will treat you the same. I think of Patrick Henry. Um, you know, the war has already begun, and if you want to live in denial, may your chains sit lightly upon you. May you forget that we were your countrymen. But, I mean, the evil they faced uh, was, was militarily powerful and corrupt. Uh, and the greatest military the world had ever seen. But the, the evil we face, the Redcoats just wanted to make you a slave. This New World Order with their eugenics and the rest of it, it, it is it is just such a nasty group of people. And, and they, they're so much weaker, spiritually even, than the Redcoats. I mean, it is a pathetic enemy, Stuart, and to watch them perch upon us is nauseating. Well, look, look at Lindsey Graham sitting there, Mr. Pasty Face, pencil neck lawyer um, in the Senate, talking about, you know, to an American citizen, if you want your lawyer, we're going to tell you to shut up. You're an enemy combatant. You don't get a lawyer. You know, he's not going to come black bag me. He's going to send one of you guys, somebody in the current serving military or police, because Lindsey Graham doesn't have the guts to do it. So don't be his tool. Make him come do it himself. Step aside. When the time comes, and if we are if we are forced to to fight for our freedom, all we ask is that you simply step aside, open up a can of beer, have a seat, and watch the show. Because the veterans of this country and the patriots of this country will take care of business if that's what we have to do. All you got to do is is stand down. Well, when people are overthrowing the entire Bill of Rights and Constitution, Stuart, you know, over the years I've always called for peace and the info war. But, uh, you know, I cannot deny the truth of what you're saying, that as things escalate, you, you have to tell, well, I, look, in closing, Americans bought 3 million guns in December, over 1.5 million background checks, on average over 2.1 guns sold per background check. Uh, and, and, when, and they had a survey out in USA Today, they said, why are you buying guns? And they said, we don't trust the government, civil unrest collapse. I mean, shouldn't that be a message to the system? I mean, do they really think, after all the work we've done and the history of America and all of it going back, that this is going to be a cakewalk? Yeah, I think they do, because they've mistaken our love of peace and our lawfulness. They mistake that for weakness. And, and every enemy we've ever faced has underestimated us. The British officers thought Americans would not fight. They joked about being able to take, you know, one one battalion of grenadiers and, you know, and guild half the males in America, you know, going up and down the coast. They, they, they joked about it until April 19, 1775, when they got the crap shot out of them all the way back to Boston. Then they realized they were in a fight. And in Bunker Hill, they realized that they were in a fight. When you had doctors and, and, and old men standing there and fighting to the death, that's when they, that's when they realized that they were in a fight. But every, you know, the Nazis underestimated us. Um, Tojo and, and, and Imperial Japan underestimated us. They all thought Americans were weak. We always proved them wrong, and we will again. And so, one last thing I want to say to the military is, is yeah, our dream would be a mass stand down. You just simply stand down like like the East Germans did in 1989. But if 
God forbid, if elements of our military do apply force under the laws of war to the American people and do start blackbagging Americans, there's going to be a fight, and then the people in the military will have to choose which side they're going to fight on. Just like our militias back then in 1775 had to choose which side. Some were loyalists, some and were loyal but to the But folks crown. have also got to be smart, Stuart. They're going to stage false flags and stuff to blame it on us to try to get people all organized. That's why they hate it that we're exposing their false flags because we take that tool away from them. Uh, Stuart, amazing. Thank you so much for your great work. Give us, give us one minute on Ron Paul's rise and getting behind Ron Paul. Well, like, like I said earlier uh, today, I work for the man in the, in the position we're in right now. There is nobody else who is going to stand up and say, you know, and, and refuse to use these powers as commander in chief. He's the only commander in chief who will honor his oath. Obama has already shown that he he will desecrate his oath. He doesn't care about it. He's already violated the Constitution grossly. Nobody else who's running for office has the integrity or the track record of standing up and defending the Constitution. And so, if you want to preserve this republic, um, he's your only choice as far as for president. Isn't it amazing at this key crossroads? that Jefferson reincarnated uh, you know, figuratively would be standing right there for us to choose him. And of course, he's old like the Republic as well. I mean, all the archetypes are there. It's, it's, it's like science fiction. I mean, here we are, and this archetype, you know, the elderly uh, but omnibudsman, wise Gandalf, the, the, uh, you know, the Jeffersonian spirit is right there waiting for us, never compromising, never wavering, would we choose him? I mean, I mean, it's it's right there. It's 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 very it's very providential. Well, it's also a test of uh, of us. I mean, it's 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 a sad sight to see that because of the fear of, of radical Islam, so many um, conservatives are rejecting Congressman Paul. I mean, I'm speaking as an individual. Oath Keepers does not endorse candidates, but I I can't. You know, my conscience insists that I speak out as an individual and say that if if you reject him. You will have missed a huge opportunity to solve this in a peaceful way, and in a constitutional manner, in a lawful manner, without without the American people being forced to to fight a revolution. So we, this is this is the time to only vote for an oath keeper. If you if you don't vote for someone who's going to keep their oath, if you vote for an oath breaker, that makes you an oath breaker. So and that's, would, that's I, how I see it. I agree, and I would just close with. He wins by running, though. Look, this has got to be a nightmare for the globalist. All these issues in the Fed, all of it, and, and an illustration of how many Americans do know the score. Look at how Ron Paul has grown exponentially. And again, as he's pointed out, as he said last night, he said, we're getting liberty out to people. This is about an idea that is transcendent. He understands that. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a huge victory. It's Ron Paul's success so far is like a Trenton victory. I mean, it, it is off the chart. Stuart Rhodes, OathKeepers.org. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is Teleprompter Free. And, uh, you know, we were a 35, 40-minute interview with him and one with the Bill Bean earlier, the news. I mean, wild horses can't drag me away. Even my dear little children who are at home begging for me to come home and watercolor with them. I mean, I love them more than life itself, and I, I'm, I'm here because they don't have a future if I'm not here. And you don't have a future if, if we don't stand for this. It is all happening now. I mean, I, every time Stuart's on, you know, I, I get uh, tears in my eyes. And it's not even, it's not that I'm even sad or freaked out. It's more of an involuntary you know, realizing the point of history we're in. It is, it, it is so big. <laughs> I cannot get that across to people. And the responsibility I've got, Stuart's got, Ron Paul and so many others, this is big. And all of you out there are so important. I cannot tell you how important you are. You're the eyes and ears of liberty in your town, your city, uh, your state, or in other countries. This idea of freedom is transcendent. 1776 worldwide. The Ron Paul Liberty Movement is spreading worldwide. People are imitating that worldwide. People are seeing the good side of America, not the bad side as well. They're, they're hearing us speak out and say, we don't represent these banks that have hijacked us. We represent freedom. It's that challenge that points out the evil, and it's here. So I cannot tell you enough how important you are out there watching and listening. Be a leader. Reach out to others. You are so important. Resistance is victory. And it's a cheesy line from a movie, but quite frankly, I later learned the people that wrote it are actually listeners of mine, so it's one of my lines that's in the movie. Terminator, uh, Resurrection, or whatever it's called. 
that uh, if you're listening to my voice, you are the resistance. That's an InfoWars quote. If you're hearing my voice right now, you are the resistance. When I went and saw that movie when it came out, I'd heard there were listeners and all this stuff, and I was watching. I'm like, what? Those are my quotes. People are like, well, you're getting a Terminator quote. No, that's an Alex Jones quote, folks. The answer in 1984 is 1776. That's an Alex Jones quote. But again, that's just an average person stating common sense. If you're listening to my voice, you are the resistance. And resistance is victory. Lord willing, because it's all up to God, we'll be back tomorrow night, 7 o'clock Central, for as long as we have this free internet to reach you. Please get the Stuart Rhodes interview out to everybody you know. I mean, I put a little silly video out, and it gets 2 million views, and have people like Stuart on with just incredible historical information, it gets 100,000. It needs to get 5 million. Let's get this video out to everybody. All right, that's it for InfoWars Nightly News. God bless you all.